Hello everybody. So today you've started your whole school mini adventure about mythical creatures. And I know in Key Stage 2, they're learning um, about mythical creatures at Hogwarts. So I thought I would read Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt Scanamander. Well, JK Rowling really. So let's see. About this book. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them represents the fruit of many years of travel and research. I look back across the years to the seven-year-old wizard who spent hours in his bedroom dismembering hawk lumps and I envy him the journeys to come. From the darkish jungles to the brightest desert, from the mountain peak to the marshy bogs, that grubby hawk lump encrusted boy who would track down as he grew up the beast described in the following pages. I have visited lairs, burrows and nests across five continents, observed the curious habits of magical beasts. In hundreds of continents and countries, I've witnessed their powers, gained their trust and on occasion beating them up with a travelling kettle. The first edition of Fantastic Beasts was commissioned back in 1918 by Mr Augustus Warm of Abacus Books, who was kind enough to ask me whether I would consider writing an authorised competition of magical creatures for his publishing house. I was then but a lowly Ministry of Magic employee and leapt at the chance both to augment my pitiful salary with sickles a week and to spend my holidays travelling the globe in search of new magical species. The rest is publishing history. Fantastic Beast is now in its 52nd edition. This introduction is intended to answer a few of the most frequently asked questions that have been arriving in my weekly postbag ever since this book was first published in 1927. The first of these is the most fundamental question of all. What is a beast? The definition of a beast has caused controversy over the centuries. Through this, I thought I should give you a very detailed answer. Though it might surprise some first-time students of magic zoology, the problem might become clearer to focus if we take a moment to consider three types of magical creature. The first, werewolves. Werewolves spend most of their time as humans, whether wizard or muggle. Once a month, however, they transform into a savage, four-legged beast of murderous intent and no human conscience. The centaur's habits are not like humans. They live in the wild. They refuse to wear clothing. They prefer to live apart from wizards and muggles alike and yet have intelligence equal to theirs. Troll bears are humanoid appearance. They walk upright. They may be taught a few simple words and yet are less intelligent than the dullest unicorn and possess no magical powers in their own right except for an unnatural strength. We now ask ourselves which of these creatures is a being. That is to say a creature worthy of legal rights and a voice in the governance of magical world and which is a beast early attempts at deciding which magical creatures should be designated beasts were extremely crude. Burdock Muldoon, chief of the Wizards Council in the 14th century, decree that a member of the magical community that walked on two legs would henceforth be granted the status of being and all others remain beasts. In the spirit of friendship, he summoned all beings to meet in the, with the wizards at a summit to discuss the new magical laws and found, to his intense dismay, that he had definitely miscalculated. The meeting hall was crammed with goblins who had brought with them many two-legged creatures as they could find. Little could be heard over the squawking of the Duraquars and the moaning of the Uruguays and the relentless piercing song of the Froppers. 
As wizards and witches attempted to consult the papers before them, sundry pixies and fairies whirled around their heads, giggling and jabbering. A dozen or so trolls began to smash apart a chamber with their clubs, while hags glided at their place in the search of children to eat. The council chief stood up to open the meeting and slipped on a pile of poor luck dung and ran cursing from the hall. As we see here, the mere possession of two legs was no guarantee that a magical creature could or would take an interest in the affairs of the wizard government. Embittered, Burdock swore any further attempts to integrate non-wizard members into the magical community of the Wizards Council. However, Mordor's successor, Madam Alfred Clagg, attempted to redefine beings in the hope of creating closer ties with other magical creatures. She declared that beings who could speak the human tongue, all of those could make themselves understood by the council members, were therefore invited to join the next meeting. Once again, however, there were problems. Trolls, who had been taught a few simple sentences by the goblins, proceeded to destroy the hall as before and Jarvis raced around the council's chair legs, tearing at many ankles so they could reach. Meanwhile, large delegation of ghosts, who had been barred under the leadership of the previous government on the grounds that they did not walk on two legs but glided, attended, but left in disgust when they later teamed the council's unashamed emphasis on the need to be living, as opposed to dead, as the wishes of the council. The centaurs, who under Mordor had been classified as beasts, were now, under Madame Clagg, defined as beings. Refer to the council in protest of the exclusion of the mer people, who were unable to converse in anything other than mermish while above the water. Not until 1811 were definitions found that most of the magical community found acceptable. George Stump the newly appointed Minister of Magic, decreed that a being was any creature that had sufficient intelligence to understand the laws of the magical community and to bear part of the responsibility of shaping those laws. Trolls' representatives were questioned in the absence of goblins and judged not to understand anything that was being said. They were therefore classified as beasts, despite their two legs. Mer people were invited through translators to become beings, and for the first time, fairies, pixies, gnomes, despite their humanoid appearance, were placed firmly in the beast category. Naturally, the matter has not rested there. We are all familiar with the extremists who campaign for the classification of muggles as beasts. We are all aware that the centaurs have refused being status and requested to remain beasts. Werewolves, meanwhile, have been shunted between the beast and being division for very many years. At the time of writing this, in the office for the werewolf support services at the being division, whereas the werewolf registry and the werewolf capture unit fall under the beast division. Several highly intelligent creatures are also classified as beasts because they are incapable of overcoming their own brutal natures. Acromantulas and manticores are capable of extremely intelligent speech, but will attempt to devour any human that goes near them. The Sphinx talks only in puzzles and riddles and is violent when given the wrong answer. Whereas there is continued uncertainty about the classification of a beast in the following pages, I've noted it in the entry for that creature. Let us now turn to one question that wizards and witches ask more than any other conversation at this time over magic zoology. Why don't muggles notice these creatures? Astonishing though it may seem to many wizards, muggles have not always been so ignorant to the magic and monstrosity of creatures that we've worked so long and hard to hide. A glance through Muggle art and literature in the Middle Ages reveals that many creatures they now believe to be imaginary were known to be real. 
the dragon, the griffin, the unicorn, the sphinx, the centaur. These are more and more represented in the Muggle works of that period, though usually with more comical versions. However, a closer examination of Muggle be beasts of that period demonstrate that most magical beasts either escaped Muggle notice completely or were mistaken for something else. Examine this surviving fragment of manufacture written by Brother Benedict, a monk from Worcestershire. Today, while travelling in the garden, I push aside a basil to discover a ferret of monstrosity. It did not run nor hide as ferrets are, and it leapt upon me, throwing me backwards upon the ground and crying with a most unnatural fury. Get out of it, Baldy! It did then bite my nose so viciously that I did bleed for several hours. The frere was unwilling to believe that I had met a talking ferret and did ask me whether I had been supping on Brother Bonfire's wine. As my nose was still swollen and bloody, I was excused from the Vespers. Evidently, our muggle friend had just an earth, not a ferret, as he supposed, but a jarvy most likely in pursuit of its favourite prey, gnomes. Imperfect understanding is often more dangerous than ignorance. The Muggles' fear of magic was undoubtedly increased by their dread of what might be lurking in their herb gardens. Muggles of the time were reaching a pitch unknown and sightings of such beasts of dragons and hippogriffs were contributing to Muggle hysteria. It is not the aim of this work to discuss the dark days that preceded wizards' retreat into hiding. All that concerns us here are the fate of those fabulous beasts that, like ourselves, would have to be concealed if muggles were ever to be convinced that magic was no such thing. The International Conference of Wizards argued that no matter what their famous summit it must not come out. No fewer than seven weeks of sometimes discussions happened between wizards and nationalities were devoted to the troublesome question of magical creatures. How many species would we be able to conceal from the Muggles? Where and how should we hide them? And the debate raged on. Some creatures were oblivious to the fact that their destiny was being decided for them and others were involved in the debate. At last, the agreement was reached. 27 species, raging in sign from dragons to buddydoms, were hidden from muggles, so as to create the illusion that they had never existed outside of the imagination. This number was increased over the following century, as wizards became more confident in their methods of concealment, and in 1750, Clause 73 was inserted into the documentation and each wizarding governing body will be responsible for the concealment, care and control of all magical beasts, beings and spirits dwelling within its territory borders. Should any creature cause harm or draw notice of the Muggle community, that nation's wizarding governing body will be subject to discipline by the International Confederation of Wizards. Magical Beasts in Hiding it would be idle to deny that there have been occasional breaches of the claw since it was put in place. Older British readers will remember the 1932 incident where a rogue Welsh dragon was swooped down upon by a crowded beach of sunbathing muggles. Fatalities were mercifully presented by the brave actions of holidaying wizards who immediately performed the largest batch of memory charms formed. But I think it's time we looked at what some of those creatures are. I wonder what we're going to find. The A to Z of the Fantastic Beasts. Ooh, an Acromantula. The Acromantula is a monstrous eight-eyed spider capable of human speech. It originated in Borneo where it inhabits the dense jungles. Its distinctive features include the thick black hair that covers its body. Its leg span, which may reach up to 15 feet, 
its pincers, which produce a distinctive clicking sound when the acromantula is excited or angry, and a poisonous secretion. The acromantula is carnivorous and prefers large prey. It spins dome-shaped webs upon the ground. The female is bigger than the male and may lay up to 100 eggs at a time. Soft and white, these are as large as beach balls. The young hatch in six to eight weeks. The acromantula eggs are defined as a class A non-tradable good by the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures meaning that severe penalties are attached to their importation or sale. The beast is believed to be, the, to be wizard bred, possibly intended to guard wizard dwellings or treasure, as is often the case with magical, magically created monsters. Despite its human intelligence, the acromantula is untrainable and highly dangerous to wizards and muggle alike. Rumours that a colony of acromantulas has been established in Scotland have been confirmed by no other than Harry Potter and Ron Weasley. Wow. What else should we have a look at? Ooh. Shall we have a look at a basilisk? Oh! <gasps> The first recorded basilisk was bred by Herpo the Fowl, a Greek dark wizard of the parcel mouth, who discovered that after much experimentation, that a chicken egg hatched beneath a toad would produce a gigantic serpent possessed of extraordinary dangerous powers. The basilisk is a brilliant green serpent that may reach up to 50 feet in length. The male has a scarlet plume upon its head. It is exceptionally venomous. Its fangs are the most dangerous part of its attack, but not as bad as its gaze of its large yellow eyes. Anyone looking directly into these will suffer instant death. If the food source is sufficient, the basilisk will eat all mammals and reach a very great age. The creation of basilis has been illegal since medieval times, although the practice is easily conce concealed by simply removing the chicken egg from beneath the toad when the department come to check. However, since basilis are uncontrollable except by parcel mouths, they are as, as dangerous to most dark wizards as to anybody else. And there have been no recorded sightings of basilis in Britain for at least 400 years. Well, that's what you'd think anyway. Let's see what else we can find. Oh, Doxy. Let's have a look at Doxy. The Doxy is often mistaken for a fairy, though it's quite a separate species. Like the fairy, it has a minute human form, though in the Doxy's case, this is covered in thick black hair and has an extra pair of arms and legs. The Doxy's wings are thick, curved and shiny, much like a beetle's. Doxes are found throughout Northern Europe and America, preferring cold climates. They lay up to 500 eggs at a time and bury them, and the eggs hatch in two to three weeks. Doxes have double rows of sharp, venomous teeth, and an antidote should certainly be taken if bitten. Wow. Let's see what else. Or oh, the Erkling. Let's have a look at the Erkling. The Erkling is an elfish creature which originated in the Black Forest in Germany. It is larger than a gnome, three feet on average, with a pointed face and a high-pitched cackle that is particularly entrancing to children, whom it will attempt to lure away from their guardians and eat. Strict controls by the German Ministry of Magic, however, have reduced Erkling killings dramatically over the last few centuries. And the last known Erkling attack upon a six-year-old boy, wizard Bruno Schmidt, resulted in the death of the Erkling when Master Schmidt hit it very hard over the head with his father's collapsible cauldron. Hmm? Fairy. The fairy is a small and decorative beast of little intelligence, often used 
or conjured by wizards for decoration. The fairy generally inhabits woodlands or glades, ranging in height from 1 to 5 inches. The fairy has a minute humanoid body and the head and limbs sport large insect-like wings, which may be transparent or multicoloured according to the types. The fairy possesses a very weak brand of magic that it may use to deter predators. It's quarrelsome in nature, but excessively vain. It will become docile on any occasion when it is called to act as an ornament. Despite its human-like appearance, the fairy cannot speak. It makes a high-pitched buzzing noise to communicate with its fellows. And then there are loads and loads of other mythical creatures and Hogwarts beasts in this book. And if you don't have access to the book, if you go onto the Pottermore website, then you can see them on there as well. And you can also take the Potter quiz and find out which Harry Potter Hogwarts house you would be in. Would it be Slytherin, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff? Only one way to find out. Where's that sorting hat? Better go find it. See you later.